Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for another Thursday evening program here with the Genealogy Center. We're glad that you're here, and we're looking forward to tonight's program, which will focus on researching in the midst of records loss. Our speaker is Jennifer Rodesant, and she's a professional genealogist and educator specializing in DNA and Southern United States research. She's the Director of American Studies at the International Institute of Genealogical Studies, and Jennifer applies um, genealogy standards to resolve complex research objectives. So we're excited to have her here with us this evening, and I'll go ahead and hand it over to her. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. I am excited to be here with you today and talk about one of my um, favorite topics, uh, record loss. Um, let me go ahead and get started here. Um, so today we're going to go over, um, after the fire, techniques for overcoming record loss. And we're going to go over some um, different pointers, techniques, tips, and tricks. And then at the end, we will have a, um, a an example, a small case study, where we will go over how to um, identify two men and separate them in er areas that have both experienced record loss. So quickly, we're going to review the genealogy standards, and then we're going to do a little bit more explanation on the what, why, and how of record loss. Um, and we'll talk about why, you know, it's really important to know why um, there was record loss in the area. We always want to add the historical context to our research. Um, we'll talk about locality and jurisdictions. What are they and how do we use them in our research? Locating surviving sources um, and recreated sources. So are there any records that survived? How do we locate them? And how about recreated uh, sources? Those are ones that are remade um, in an area that has suffered record loss. And then we will go over the case study and the example of the two men in Kentucky and Tennessee that both originated from North Carolina and there's record loss everywhere. So the genealogy standards was put out for the board for certification of genealogists and it is kind of an outline for us on how we should conduct uh, quality research. So there's uh, five points to it. We always want to conduct reasonably exhaustive research. And this is finding as many sources as we can online and offline and considering historical context, um, kind of the whole, the whole, um, you know, everything of the situation. We want to have complete and accurate source citations, all of the, um, the presentation is in source cited and anything that has been um, pictures if there's permission granted or the terms of service allow for it. Um, analysis and correlation. Um, we wanna look at all of the records that we have, analyze them um, for you know, source information and evidence who created the source and then correlate all of the information within to verify, you know, if there's any conflicts or if everything, you know, seems good in our research. If there are conflicts, we want to resolve all of those conflicts before um, we move on. Um, and if they can't be resolved, we want to write an explanation as to why. And then, of course, we want to write it up because writing is discovery. Um, you will always learn more about your research if you write it than if you kind of just analyze it in your head. Um, when you write it down, then you have proof. We want to watch out for confirmation bias and assumptions. So we don't want to ignore potential evidence to fit our confirmation bias. Um, you don't you don't want to assume the answer before you already have looked at the evidence and gathered the information. Um, you want to make sure that you are collecting all sources that can answer the research objective. So not just relying on sources that might be online or easy sources. You want to also look at um, land records, military records church rec records, and we'll talk about how all of those fit into different jurisdictions in a little bit. 
You want to consider and recognize assumptions. You, you want to make sure that you're not assuming anything, that you're relying on the information and the evidence in the sources to guide you um, and not assuming the correct answer. You know, you want to make sure that um, the fundamental assumptions are generally accepted as true. So a woman who died in 1797, she didn't give birth to a child in 1803. Um, that would be impossible. Um, a valid assumption would be generally accepted as true unless convincingly contradicted. So a two-year-old girl living in the home of an 85-year-old woman is certainly not her biological child, but you never know. There's always the off chance, right? That one-off situation. And an unsound assumption would be valid, but cannot be accepted without supporting evidence. Um, so when evidence is not found, the assumption can be validated. If the evidence isn't found, the assumption is not supported. So one is all records in Warren County, Kentucky were destroyed in the fire. So there was a fire, some guerrillas burned the county. Um, and if you look on family search or different, um, you know, sources online, it will tell you that Warren County had record loss from that fire, but that is not true. It did not have record loss. They were able to save the records. All right. So the what and the why and the how of record loss. Um, so what is a burned county? You hear that a lot. Um, generally, when a county has experienced record loss, we, we call it a burned county, even if it wasn't due to fire. So, um, but it's primarily, you'll see, I have some examples later that primarily it is due to fire. A burned county has experienced record loss. Um, it's usually at the courthouse, but it can also be the county clerk's office. Um, or the county recorder's office if they're in different buildings, or if a historical society is holding the records for a county. Um, that would also um, be considered, um, you know, record loss. Uh, you don't want to stress when you research a burn county. There are lots of tips. There's resources out there for you. Um, there's books, um, you know, just look at all of the jurisdictions, look at all of the um, records online, and we will go over that a little bit later. So this is, uh, there was a big fire in Shasta County, California, and this is just a, a newspaper article about that, and the entire community was destroyed, and that was in the Great Fire of Shasta in 52, 1852. So there's a lot of reasons that uh, record loss happens. There could be a fire, a tornado, flooding, war, earthquake, um, and fire, and fading ink. There's other reasons too. Uh, one of the big misconceptions is that a lot of record loss is a result of war, particularly in the South, and that is not true. Um, there is a minimal amount that was from the Civil War. Um, so I have some statistics on that in a little bit. There's also other ways that we can lose our records. Um, deterioration, water damage. Um, you can see in this record right here, there's water damage on it and the ink has kind of faded away. You can still see a little bit of the page. Vermin, bookworms, um, theft is another reason, hurricanes, arson. So there's so many reasons that, um, that we can lose our records and, um, you know, it's unfortunate. <laughs> okay. um, this is an example of some record loss in LaRue County, Kentucky. A courthouse burned on Tuesday afternoon. Bill Hughes and about 20 guerrillas, they went into this um, town in Kentucky and set fire to the courthouse and they totally destroyed it. Um, so they did no other damage. They just went in there and they burned the county courthouse. Um, this is what a lot of the guerrillas were doing when they were moving through the community. Um, and these were Confederate guerrillas burning um, the county in a Confederate state. So, you know, it could be either side. 
burning the records. Um, there were Spencer County is a courthouse that was burned during the Civil War, and this is in Kentucky. Um, a gentleman who arrived here yesterday from Bloomfield states that guerrillas burned the courthouse and jail buildings in Taylorville last Saturday. So another situation where, you know, guerrillas were burning courthouses in Kentucky. Kentucky has a lot of um, courthouses that were burned during the Civil War. It's the, the state with the most courthouses burned during the war. Um, so in 15 months of war, Confederate soldiers burned 12. Guerrillas who were Confederate, they burned eight, and Union soldiers burnt two by accident. Um, so this is kind of how the, the, the courthouse in Spencer County was burned. And this gives us a historical context on the area. We always want to know, you know, what was happening in there that would impact our ancestors' lives. So we had ancestors living in the area. We would know, hey, there was guerrillas that came in. It was probably a pretty scary experience for you know, everybody in, in the area, and then they burned all of the records. Um, so the, the Letchfield County Courthouse in Grayson County was burned. Um, and there's also other kind of, so in 1864, it burned by fire, 1896 and 1936 also by fire. So it burned several times. So it might not be kind of a one-off situation. There could be several, you know, several times that the county courthouse burned. There's still several collections available pre-1864 from the first fire, but probate and land records were lost. So if you're working in this county, you're going to want to start looking at kind of alternative jurisdictions, and we'll go over jurisdictions later, a little bit later. Clinton County, um, Kentucky, burned during the Civil War. Of course, it was by guerrillas. It seems like it's always by guerrillas. Um, the county courthouse was reconstructed in the 70s, and several record collections were burned um, in 65. So the deeds, court orders pre-1864 and probate pre-1865. So this is a pretty terrible loss. Um, those records have great genealogical information. The deeds can have genealogical information and they can also place you next to your fans. So they're really key in genealogy research. This is two record sets that you really want to look at always and of course um, court records too are are a really big loss um so you know this one we're looking at um some people in the town they had paid taxes so this is an alternative record we can look at um, since we've lost the land records this is telling us that these these people here had land Um, what records are held at the courthouse? Uh, it depends on the courthouse, really, um, but generally it was probates, estates, wills, tax records, sometimes military records, um, civil and criminal records, court minutes, which also can hold really good genealogy information, genealogical information, tell us about who was in the area and when they were there. Um, so there's a lot of records that are held there at the courthouses. It complicates research because we're losing these really good genealogical sources with key information in them, and they're gone forever, generally, unless the county's recreated some. But even then, they're, they're um, you know, the information in it, it's a derivative record. So it's it wasn't created at the time of the event. It's more prone to error. Um, you know, we lose the direct evidence that answers our research question in, in you know, it doesn't tell us exactly who Jane Smith's dad was. And so we need to start looking at all of the Smiths in the area. And it just gets a lot more research and a lot more, you know, time involved. Assuming a courthouse burned is total loss, don't do it. Just like Warren County, even though Family Search says that it was a total loss, it wasn't. So you really want to investigate it. Um, you could go to the Family Search catalog, and even looking at the catalog, uh, Warren County has a whole t whole ton of records on available. And not knowing if the county is burned, so when you're you know, researching your ancestors and 
you're looking at a particular county that you're in researching, you want to you want to look at the history of the county, um, not only for record loss, but for bounty boundary changes. So um, you could do that on Family Search Research Wiki, and and don't believe it's too impossible or difficult. Um, so you could log into Family Search um, to determine if your county suffered record loss. And through the search function, you'll click Research Wiki, enter the name of the county and state, and you can scroll down to record loss. Um, this is also how you can check what record of record sets are available in that county and um, anytime the boundaries changed. So there are 3,142 counties, parishes, and equivalent burned in the United States. And 689 of them at, the, at least have suffered record loss. Uh, Kentucky, North Carolina, Georgia, Texas, Missouri are states that have suffered a lot of record loss. Um, Georgia, Kentucky, and Tennessee are the top three. Um, here, the greed one is the Civil War. So you can see that Civil War is not a very big reason for record loss, but often, um, you know, if you have it, you know, there can be total destruction or not. Um, so you have to really research the county. Um, and then this is the total counties. So in Georgia, about 80 of the total counties are burned and same in Kentucky, but there's only 120 counties or so. So Kentucky has pretty serious record loss. Um, there's a lot of strategies you can use. You can determine what year the disaster happened. You want to verify the loss of records. You want to understand the entire family. So you want to use the friends, associates, and neighbors method. Um, look at all of the siblings of your person of interest, the parents of your person of interest, if you know them, um, any of the children of the siblings of the person of interest, any neighbors, um, just the whole picture, everybody that's involved in your neighbors, in your person of interest life. Um, and you want to identify all of the remaining collections online or offline. So you can use the family search catalog um, and also any historical societies that are in the county, um, state archives, digital archives, the state library, um, start looking at all of the places that hold record sets. And there are others in different jurisdictions, and we'll talk about that. We want to create a research plan um, of all of the, you know, what are your top sources that you can use of the records that you found that are available and remaining in that area, and create a timeline or a map uh, so that you know um, what you already have, and if you're dealing with one person or two, and have a map of the area so you know where your ancestor lived. And if they lived on like a boundary of a county, you might want to look at the county that's next to it or the state that's next to it. Um, understand locality and jurisdictions. Um, also, here's the, we're going to talk about the locality and the jurisdictions. Um, we always want to start with the research objective. We want to define the question. Um, and then we can move on to the locality and jurisdictions within that question. Um, this is, a, you know, obviously this is a jurisdiction, right? The state of California. And then within the state of, within this jurisdiction, um, we have, you know, previous jurisdictions that were um, Native American tribes. So, you know, this is an example of a jurisdiction. The United States would be another one, um, a county. Um, there's also, you know, other jurisdictions. Uh, the military would be a jurisdiction. Family sources, societies, um, you know, institutions, church records, legal records, um, you know, state, uh, you know, United States, so federal. So you have to, you know, look at the whole big picture and what is available in that area. And these are just some examples of what you could find in different jurisdictions. You know, in family and religion, you could find baptismal records. Institution could be prison records. Um, government, you could have um, vital records. 
business and employment coal miner records. Or societies could have meeting minutes that put your ancestor in a certain area. Um, so there's a lot of different things that you can look at um, that could replace, you know, record loss. Um, general ledgers, institutions, a lot of, you know, historical societies or local archives will have um, general ledgers. I just found one um, where my ancestors were in an area that suffered record loss from the 1906 earthquake. And so I was able to find a general ledger that placed my ancestors in the area at the time, and I was able to get their address, which was a pretty big clue. Um, and that was at a local archive. And then, of course, there's the um, boundaries and borders. You want to understand when the counties were formed. Um, you know, if there's record loss in the county where your ancestors were living in, they could have lived in the, a different county, um, you know, previously and that parent that new county formed within that parent county and i have an example of that within the um, case study that we're going to talk about uh, you want to utilize the border changes to identify ancestors or people of interest if they moved within the boundaries or if they're um you know if their land if they really moved or if their land was moving within that new county um so really considering the boundary as well as the historical context of the record loss. Um, this is an example of some um, boundary changes in Clinton County, Kentucky. Um, in 1792, it was formed from Virginia. Then it became Green County that was formed from Lincoln and Nelson. Um, in 1798, Cumberland formed from Green. And in 1800, Green found from Cumberland and Pulaski. And then in 35, Clinton County formed from Cumberland and Wayne. So if you had ancestors living in the area since 1798, you know, and it's 1935, there was record loss, say, um, you would also want to look at Green and Cumberland County, um, Wayne County and Pulaski County. So it just gives you more options and more places to look. And maybe those areas didn't experience record loss. Um, this is a really cool website. It's by the Newgate Newberry Library. Um, Dr. William Scholl um, created it. It's a moving border. Um, so here it's 1811 Kentucky. So we can see all of the current boundary lines of the counties. Um, and it tells you the effective date through, um, you know, March 18, 15. And then we're looking at 1831, and we can see how much the counties have changed, you know, become, they've doubled, really. There's a lot more counties in Kentucky in just a short amount of time, right? That almost less than 15 years. So um, that really gives you an example of here. So Warren County, right here, you can see how small it is in 1831 and how much larger it was in 1811. So new counties formed from Warren. We wanna locate surviving sources. Um, there's lots of repositories you could use, the catalog at Family Search, County Archives, the Bureau of Land Management for land patents, um, federal, you know, national archives, state archives, county archives, um, you know, lots of places to look. Um, to log into the catalog, you would follow the same steps that you used. Um, you know, log into Family Search, click Search, except this time you're going to click Catalog, and then you'll select a place and search. Just make sure you're not entering county at the end. So you would, instead of San Francisco County, you'd put San Francisco, California. Otherwise, you'll get a negative uh, search result. So here are some surviving Grayson County uh, collections. There was the you know, problem in 1864, the um, guerrillas burned the county, so there was record loss. So there are records pre-record um, you know, pre loss. So we've got 1837, 1840, 1859. So there is records still available. So there wasn't total record loss, which usually is the case. There's usually something is still surviving. So there's a lot that you could do with that. 
And then also family sources. Um, you want to correspond with your family, um, see what they have, if they have any documents or photographs or Bibles. Um, it can help you really expand your research. Uh, this is a photograph that I have of my ancestor. It was held by my grandparents. Um, and at the bottom, you can see that he was a reverend, so Reverend Clisby Austin. And um, I, I didn't add it to the presentation, I should have, but in 1836, um, he was made a deacon of the Methodist Church in Knox County. And um, I found this out because I found this here and I realized that he was a reverend and I did additional search. I found out that he was a reverend in the Methodist Episcopal Church in the Holston Conference um, in East Tennessee. I contacted the Holston Conference archives and they sent me a, um, you know, when the document of when he was made a deacon in 1836. So the family sources can lead you to additional sources. Um, then there are replacement sources. Um, we can duplicate the sources, um, you know, using a derivative source that was re kind of recreated, a substitute source. So something else, like instead of a census record, we can use a tax record. So we can still place them in the area. Um, you know, it might not give us as, as much information as the census, but still, we can still place them there. Um, a substitute record contains same or similar information. Um, and then a replacement is a recreation of a record. So, you know, there was record loss in the county. Maybe the county recreated the marriage licenses or the land records. Um, there's a duplicate marriage record in Warren County. It would be a handwritten or typed copy of a, an original derivative sources. They're, they're more prone to error, as I mentioned previously. So, you know, they're, you know, we could have information that's maliciously changed or, you know, somebody just made an error in memory. Um, we want to reach review the entire page for friends and family and known associates. Um, this is a replacement marriage record. Um, my, this is the claim of Ellen Grundy. It was found in a military record. Um, it's a question and answer from a civil war, uh, pension file. Um, Ellen Grundy's husband died and she took over his pension. Um, and so, you know, in this, um, we uncover that she married George Grundy on September 27th, 1869 in Batavia, New York, and it was done by, um, solemnized by Reverend Massey. Uh, this is a duplicate marriage record. Um, here you can see there are several creeks. So looking at the whole um, thing, we're looking for Jacob Creek. Um, he married Jane Gage, and it was solemnized by an unknown reverend or pastor. Um, we can see that there were several other Creeks married as well. Um, George Creek was solemnized and um, Rhonda McLean was solemnized by Matthew Rogan. And Isaac Creek's marriage was solemnized by uh, G. Joran. Um, so we could use additional information and try to determine who solemnized it. Um, but that's a derivative record. Um, we could use census records to and uh, tax, li tax list to replace census records. Military records could also replace census records in marriage records. Um, manuscripts and letters could replace, um, you know, census records. Like a, a manuscript could be a, um, like I was talking about, a general ledger. So you have receipts um, and you can place your ancestor in an area based on the general ledger. Um, so there's lots of substitute records that we could use um, that are not within the county. So school and college records or yearbooks, court of appeals records that are usually, you know, with the state instead of the county, um, retirement and pension records. So a railroad pension record. Um, there's a lot of different sources that we could use. State Supreme Court records, they're not within the county. Cemetery, funeral, 
home records. So a cemetery could know when the person was born, when the person died, when the person was buried, if there is a deed to the plot as well. So there could be a lot of information you can gather from a funeral home or a cemetery. Um, for substitute sources, they contain the same or similar information. Um, here in 1769, Reuben Riggs and Mary Crawford were bonded to Mary on the 2nd of March in Rowan County, North Carolina. In 1818, Reuben purchased 150 acres from Joseph Brown on the 19th of November in Granger County, Tennessee. And we want to know where Re was Reuben Riggs, who married Mary Crawford in 1769 in Rowan County, North Carolina, about 1790 and 1800. Um, we want to know if he was the same person as the Reuben Riggs who purchased 150 acres from Joseph Brown in Granger County. So we want to know what two sources can we substitute for the lost census records to locate Reuben Riggs in 1790 and 1800 in Tennessee. Um, so these are some of the records we can use. Um, I've used tax records um, as an example, and this will be in the case study. So we're gonna look at tax records, we're gonna look at military pensions, and we're gonna look at um, court minutes to prove um, if they were the same person or not. Uh, so this is a substitute uh, death record. Um, Fanny Robinson died on 11th of June, 1892, and this was in the cemetery information and on the um, inscription on the tombstone. And then we get a little bit more information about her religious um, life. She had a hymn from a, the Christian Stone Campbell movement inscribed on it. So just gives a, a little more insight into her life and, you know, there could be church records to identify for her. Um, this is a tax substitute for the 1800 census. Uh, the 1800 census is lost in Tennessee. William Smith lived in Granger County. He owned over 1,005 acres of land. He didn't pay a, a poll tax, so it's telling us that he was over a certain age or he, ser he served in the military, and it places uh, him in Granger County and substitutes law census records. Um, these are taxless substitutes, and these can substitute land records. Um, this tells us how much land was owned by an individual. So um, John Craig was taxed for 300 acres of land in 1846. And tax records show he owned land in, in Clinton County, Kentucky. Uh, this is a replacement marriage record. Um, this was in a, a Civil War widow's pension file. Um, the, they were married in uh, Nashville, uh, Tennessee. The records were destroyed. The marriage records were destroyed. So they had a recreated record. So this is a replacement. Um, in 1863, Union soldiers, they raided the courthouse in Hawkins County, Tennessee. It wasn't a total loss. Uh, they were instructed to put the records back um, by an officer. So there is some record loss um, in Hawkins, but not all of them, not all of it. So here we have a research objective. Um, was Reuben Riggs, who lived in Washington County, Tennessee in 1787, the same Reuben Riggs who signed the marriage bond of Jane Creek and Jane Gage in 1803 in Warren County, Kentucky. Uh, so we know Reuben Riggs lived in 1787 in Washington County, Tennessee, and he moved to 1799. He was living in Granger County. So we want to know if he moved or if the land shifted. Um, Jacob Creek and Jane Gage bonded to marry in 1803 on the 1st of June. And uh, Reuben Briggs was their bondsman. And on Ancestry, 756 trees identify Jane's father as a Reuben Riggs from Tennessee. So this is a big problem that I wanted to resolve. There's a lot of record loss in, um, in East Tennessee. So I kind of want to, you know, identify who is who on this. 
uh, Warren County, Kentucky. It formerly it was Logan County, Kentucky, which was created from Lincoln County, Kentucky, which was created from Virginia. Um, so we want to look at the boundary changes there. And then also for Granger County, um, we can see in 1796, it was created from Knox and Hawkins County. In 1792, Knox was created from Green and Hawkins. So Hawkins kind of went back and forth. And then in 1786, Hawkins was created from Sullivan and Green counties. Um, so there was a fire at the Warren County Courthouse. And Family Search Wiki states that most of the record, records were destroyed. Um, as we went over before, they really weren't. There were gorillas in Bowling Green um, at the same time as the courthouse disaster. So it seems like the fire wasn't successful. Um, here we have the, um, the record that has caused a lot of confusion online. This is a marriage bond between Jane Gage and Jacob Creek. And here we can see that Reuben Riggs signed he acted as bondsman and that uh, Jane's father is actually Daniel Gage. We can tell that the handwriting is the same as Daniel. Um, there's also another person that witnessed here, but they are, the assumption is on um, ancestry that Ruben Riggs of Tennessee is this person and that he's the father. Obviously, Daniel Gage is the father, not Ruben, but which Ruben Riggs is this? Um, there were two Reuben Riggs, uh, Tennessee and Kentucky. That's how I'll refer to them. Um, we went over the, the first Reuben. He lived in Washington County, Kentucky. He married uh, Mary Crawford um, in 1769 in Rowan County, uh, North Carolina. And then there was the Reuben Riggs who was bonded to Mary Catherine Sailing in 1796 in Mercer County, Kentucky. And in 1800, he was living in Warren County. Um, so here we have an example of a signature of Reuben Riggs um, and then a mark of Jesse Gage. So this was the marriage record of Reuben Riggs here, Tennessee. Um, Reuben Riggs of Kentucky, he paid uh, taxes in 1782 in North Carolina, and Daniel Gage was also living in Rutherford County. Um, so we've got them both in the same county in North Carolina. In 1796, Reuben was bonded to Mary Catherine Sealing. Um, we have an original signature for that. In 1800, Reuben, Riggs, and Daniel Gage both moved and were living in Warren County, Kentucky. So it seems like they're moving together. And then in 1812, Reuben, was, he moved from Warren County, um, Kentucky to Bedford County, Tennessee. And Daniel Gage had been living in Bedford since at least 1809. So we can see that this is a family group, right? So they're moving from um, North Carolina to Kentucky and then over to Tennessee. Um, and so then Reuben, he moved to Morgan County, Illinois in 1820. Daniel Gage stayed in Tennessee. So they split at that point. This is why it's important to research the friends and associates and neighbors because um, we can see that Daniel Gage and Reuben Riggs are in the same family group. Um, so I still wanna look at North Carolina, Riggs and Gage. So we can see that they were living both in North Carolina. Timothy Riggs also paid taxes in Rutherford County. So we've got another, um, another person named Riggs in the area to consider. And then we can see Timothy, Daniel, and Reuben Riggs, a land grant. And this places them in Rutherford County, North Carolina in 1791. Um, so there was a Timothy Riggs who lived near Daniel Gage in 1786. So this is a likely a, um, a possible family member of Reuben Riggs. At least they have the same surname. So there's likely some familial connection. And then we have Reuben's marriage to Catherine Sailing in 1796, and this was in Mercer County, Kentucky. And so we can see that he was bonded. Here's his signature here. And then we have a derivative record that places Reuben Riggs and Daniel Gage both in Warren County, Kentucky in 1800-1801, um, which is just a few years before Daniel Gage or before Jane Gage and Jacob Creek were married in 1803. 
So they're right in the same county in the same area. Um, we can see that he was in Rutherford. Um, he moved to Mercer County. He lived in Warren County, Kentucky. Then he moved to Bedford County. And then he moved to Morgan County, Illinois. So there's a lot of movement here. So it's good when you're trying to identify somebody to um, create a timeline. I think that's helpful. Um, and then we're looking at Granger County, um, Tennessee for the Tennessee Reuben Ricks. So there was a courthouse fire in 1946. Uh, most of the records were kept in a vault, but there was some damage to documents and filing cabinets um, and ad additional documents were at other locations. So here we can see in 1771, we have three other Reuben Riggs men that were living in Surrey County with Reuben. We've got Edward, Samuel, and Clisby Riggs. Um, so they were living in Surrey County while the other Riggs were living in um, Rutherford County. And this is them on the tax record. In 1769, Reuben was married to um, Mary Crawford in North Carolina. And David Crawford was reported as Mary's father. So here they are, uh, Mary Crawford, 1769, and Reuben Riggs, Edward Riggs, and David Crawford. So we see Edward Riggs again, which is consistent with the um, tax record that we saw in 1771. And then we have the tax substitute and the seven, to substitute the 1790 census. This is from 1787, Washington County, Tennessee. Um, we can see that Reuben lived in Washington. Uh, he owned 200 acres of land. And um, so that's important to remember that 200 acres of land. And then we can see in 1799, he was living in Granger County. Um, the 1800 census is lost. Um, he was living in Granger, but he still owned the 200 acres of land. And that is because the he didn't move, the county line shifted. He didn't pay a poll tax. Um, there was a Jesse Riggs that lived next to Reuben. Um, so he's another possible family member that we would want to research. And then we have his signature and his Revolutionary War pension. He served, um, he was living in North Carolina and he moved to the Yakadin River where he served during the Revolutionary War um, fighting against the Native Americans. Um, and he stayed in um, East Tennessee where he was at the time. And then he signed the pension in Giles County, Tennessee. So he had a move sometime between um, when he owned the land in uh, Granger County and he moved to Giles County. Um, so we have his signature, which is a little more rough than the other one. In 1803, Reuben Riggs was appointed Justice of the Peace for Granger County. And so this is a really big key of it is it couldn't be this Reuben Riggs. If he was appointed Justice of the Peace in Granger County, Tennessee, he couldn't have been in um, Warren County, Kentucky um, at the same time. It's a 427 round mile trip over the Appalachian Mountains and the Cumberland Plateau. It's a it, it would be a large huge trip in 1803. Um, and there's no way he would have been able to get there and back in time to um, become justice of the peace. So here we kind of have a, a roundup of the Reuben Riggs of Tennessee. We can see he married Mary Crawford. Um, he moved to Hawkins where he purchased um, land with Samuel and Clisby Riggs who witnessed a deed. And then in 1805, he paid for taxes in Granger. Um, in 1832, he attested to serving three months in the Yakadan River. He moved to Washington County, North Carolina, now in East Tennessee in 1780. So we can see that Washington County, Tennessee became Hawkins County, which became Granger County. So that's kind of how um, the records are moving around. Um, we saw a Jesse Riggs that next that was living next to him in the 1800. Um, tax list and Jesse Riggs of Lincoln County um, was mentioned as would have knowledge of his service in um, in the pension of Reuben Riggs. And then he moved to Granger County where he lived in 1808 until he moved to Pulaski. 
So we could see that we have the conflict, right? So we have Reuben Riggs. He was sworn in as justice of the peace in February 1803 or in June 1803 in Granger County. Jacob Creek and Jane Gage were bonded to Mary on 11th of June 1803 in um, Warren County, Kentucky. So it's unlikely that he Reuben would have made a round trip of the huge amount of miles from Warren County back to Granger County. Um, you know, while serving, while he's going to be justice of the peace, um, and, you know, over the Cumberland Plateau in, you know, that time period, that's a really large trip over the mountain range. Here we have a timeline of Reuben, um, in 1769, we can see he married Mary Crawford. Then he moved to Washington County, Tennessee, where he paid taxes. He purchased the 200 acres of land. He paid taxes in Granger County, um, appointed justice of the peace, and then he moved to Giles County, where he filed the Revolutionary War pension. And then we have a signature comparison. Um, we can see that the Creek um, Gage marriage bond, Reuben Riggs, is kind of nice and you know rounded. Um, and then we have the Reuben Riggs from Warren County, who married Catherine Sealing, nice and round signature. Well, we have Reuben Riggs, who's a little bit more, um, you know, it's it's not as it's not as smooth. But this is when he was older. But the R is totally different on both of them, right? So Reuben Riggs, who lived in Granger County, County, Tennessee, he was identified in the trees on ancestry as the father. He is not. He was not the bondsman for Jane Gage and Jane Creeks married. He was not the father of Jane Gage. Uh, that was Daniel Gage. And he signed the marriage bond and said he was his fa her father. And Reuben Riggs, who lived in Warren County in 18 1800, um, he acted as bondsman for Jane Gage in Jacob Creek. So it was actually the Reuben Riggs of Kentucky, not the you know one in Tennessee. Um, so we've learned that, you know, record loss, it's not always caused by fire. We can lose records from tornadoes or vermin or theft, um, earthquakes, lots of different reasons, lots of situations. Um, we can look and see on Family Search, a research wiki, and also there's random acts of genealogical kindness. And these can help us identify burned counties, and some state archives will list burned counties. Um, as well. Uh, additional research might be needed. Um, you might want to, you know, start looking at different jurisdictions, uh, different record sets that are available in those jurisdictions. Um, and that can be done through looking at the family search catalog, you know, reading the history of the county of the area in the area when your ancestor was living there and to see what was in, in the area. Did they serve in the military? Um, that type of thing. Take a look at the jurisdictions, the movement of the counties, um, and then you want to use online and offline records and always research the friends, the family, the associates, the neighbors, because oftentimes, especially, um, you know, back in 1803, people were moving together as family groups. They didn't just move, you know, one family like we do now. Um, they really needed the whole unit to survive. Um, so take a look at everybody that you can, um, any questions? Thank you so much. We have a couple of questions for you. Um, so the first one is this person is wondering about marriage records for Breckenridge County, Kentucky. Um, they say they know from alternative records who the justice of the peace performing the ceremony was in this was a marriage around 1814 and they're wondering if you have ideas for finding any records that he might have left besides the courthouse yeah so i would look at the state archives um there could be a collection at the archives that has you know a journal that he used when he um you know signed you know everybody's marriage um you can also look with the church so if they're is um i know with the methodist episcopal church there's the conferences um with the catholic church there's the archdiocese um so you want to research the church and see 
who in that area handles the archives for that particular church. Most churches have archives and hold on to their records. Okay, thank you. And for our other question, um, I was wondering about um, a marriage that took place in Western North Carolina about 1805. Um, wondering where you might look um, if you have recommendations specific to that area. I would look and see if they were possibly involved in the War of 1812 and if there's a pension record available. Um, and then look at churches in the area. Um, for that, you want to look on Family Search, but you also want to look offline. So you mm -hmm. can contact a historical society in the area and see if they have any, um, you know, records of early church records, or if they can direct you in, um, you know, the right direction of, you know, either a conference or an archdiocese type of um, group. And then, you know, I would say. Um, I don't know. Uh, other than that, I mean, those are the two that I would start with, those two for sure. Great. Thank you. So I just wanted to mention, um, if anybody has any questions following today's program, you're welcome to send us an email at genealogy at acpl.info, and we will stick that in the chat. And um, please email us as well if you would like a copy of the chat from uh, today's Zoom program. So thank you again, everybody, for attending this evening. And thank you, Jennifer, so much for your time and sharing all of this great information. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.